This lecture is on African art and authenticity. It is meant to explain to you what African authenticity is and why the notion of African authenticity is problematic in art history. This content relates to assignment one of ARH 3702 and it also relates to the first question that you will get in the exam. For this lecture, I'm focusing mainly on the, artist, uh, the article by Sidney Casphere, which I uploaded onto the e-reserves. There's another article by Sandra Klopper that is not on the e-reserves, but you can easily find it on the journal databases, which you can read for more information. I've also used some of the information in this article uh, in preparing this lecture. So first, I want you to look at these images. Um, it's a very simple Google search and you will see there on top where it says related searches, it says African art paintings, abstract African art, traditional African art, contemporary African art or South African art. So when we Google something like that, you will find pictures that look a lot like this. So the question I want to ask you before we continue is why would you say these images are authentically African or not authentically African? Most of you would probably say that they are indeed authentically African. But why do you say so? Is it because of the colors? Is it because of the shapes? Is it because of the way that the paint was applied? The themes maybe? The inclusion of African landscapes, people and villages? Or maybe the inclusion of African wild animals? Okay, let's move on. What about these images? Okay. We see bright colors again. We see people that looks like they might have African masks. But we also see some other things, new mediums, some installation art, sculpture. So are these authentically African or not? Do we know who these artists are, where they came from, what their gender are or their race? Let's move even further along. What about these images? What I can tell you is all of them are African artists. But you can see here that the mediums have changed, the themes have changed. We still don't know who the artists are, but what does the colors tell us? What does the shapes tell us, the approaches? Or maybe what is the artist trying to communicate? So now, again, the question is, are these now authentically African? I think you can already see that there is a problem with trying to categorize an artwork as either authentic or inauthentic. So in the article of Sydney Kasfir, she speaks about African authenticity and she critiques this notion. She says that the concept of African authenticity was constructed mainly around an idea that there is a before and after scenario of colonialism. According to this scenario, all African art before colonialism was authentic, thus untainted by Western intervention, and all art produced within a colonial or indeed a post-colonial context would therefore be inauthentic because it has been tainted by Western influence. Now there's a big problem here. The problem is, by saying this, we are saying that colonialism was the single most important event in the history of Africa, which it wasn't. Before colonialism happened, Africans lived and worked and made art in Africa for thousands of years. So we cannot say that suddenly everything just changed with colonialism. Certainly, we know that colonialism had a big influence on the history, politics and sociality in Africa. But this is connected to some myths, which we are going to deconstruct now. And, and you need to read the article by Casphere and, and read on how she writes about these myths. So here are the myths. Myth number one. 
Authentic African art excludes, excludes contamination. Contamination by what? Western influence. The reality is that African art as a category is produced via the act of collecting it. What I mean here, and again, you should go and read Kasfir's article, and possibly also Sandra Klopper's article, that when Westerners came to Africa, they started collecting African art, because to them it was interesting and different. But they only collected certain things which appealed to their specific tastes, and which they thought, according to what they thought about African art, was important and what was an African aesthetic. So collecting African art is a hegemonic activity. It means that the collection of objects, especially from Africa, has the effect that it creates a category. And within that category, it is expected that everything must be the same. So it must fit, it must look the same, it must do the same thing, it must have a set a uh, theme um, and a way of thinking about it. Also, collection of African art is a colonial enterprise. Now, Klopper, this is the article that is not on the e-reserves, which I would like you to download if you can, um, says that in the beginning, no household items and other artifacts were collected. Instead, mural art was collected, example, sun rock art. Later, sculpture was also collected. So why do you think that mural art and sculpture was collected first? The reason for this is very simple. Because in Europe, sculpture and painting were seen as the highest art forms. Thus, other things were seen as craft. This, of course, has changed in re recent years. But it's also important to know that this these preconceived ideas about art was not just related to collecting, but also to art curricula. So when African art was taught at universities, even up until very recently, it was mostly related to sun rock art, uh, Benin sculpture, um, any, any kind of, of art that somehow fitted into the Western idea of what art should be. Sandra Klopper also says that this way of thinking about African art reflects the belief that the colonists had that black Africans were primitive people with no culture. And it reflects Western aesthetic values. So through saying that African art must somehow adhere to certain principles set by Westerners is very problematic. Myth two. And this relates to the construction of a canon, in other, in other words, this big category of African art and what African art is supposed to be. And according to this myth, because we say that there was a before and after scenario of colonialism, we are in fact saying that no changes occurred in art during the early contact with Europeans. The reality is, that there is no point in time in which we could speak of an ascendancy or a decline of traditional culture. In other words, if we say that art started changing in Africa after contact with colonists, and this is a loss for traditional culture, then we are saying that before Europeans arrived, nothing happened. I think you can see why this is problematic. And this links to myth number three, that Africa has a timeless past. This myth says in the long period before colonialism, African art forms remained more or less static over centuries. The reality is that a timeless past is a fiction of an ethnographic present. This is what um, Sandra Klopper says. And this, this refers to the constant framing of Africans as primitive. In other words, Africans were primitive, then the colonists came, and then they weren't prim primitive anymore. This, you can see, is very problematic. So, the myth about a timeless past is, is robbing 
Africa of its own sense of history and is therefore highly problematic. The fourth myth is the anonymity of the artist. The implication of this is that we deny the individuality of the artist. So, many of the African artworks, in fact most of them, that were collected by colonists, they didn't know who the artist was. So, it was just described as having a tribal style and not a unique individual style of a unique person who was an artist. And the belief here which is wrong is that the individual artist neither has the power or the agency to resist or to change or to be creative. So you can see here that African authenticity um, is a problematic concept because it creates a category of African art where everything is the same, it is primitive, it is a romantic idea of an Africa with some traditional culture which should be static and never change. But we all know that culture is alive and that people have agency and that things change over time. And people incorporate new things into their cultures all the time. Um, and I'm going to just show you some examples from visual culture and then we're going to move back into art. So this is an example of a postcard um, and the caption of this postcard just says traditional life in Africa. Now you can see how this is highly problematic because we see on this picture different types of dress it is not specified what the culture is supposed to be. The people are posed here clearly in a way that creates a spectacle for the foreign visitor and paints a very specific picture of Africa. Now I'm going to show you something else. Here is another picture of former President Jacob Zuma. And he is wearing traditional clothing and he's dancing with traditional weapons. But he is wearing a pair of uh, Western shoes. So would it be right for us to say that this is not authentically African? Of course it would be wrong. Because people incorporate new things into their culture all the time. If we look at the participants to the ceremony in the back, we can also see there are many markers of modern life. So, people have agency and people make choices and they make additions to their culture every day. It is not static. Here's another example of a postcard. In the front it says, African life, South Africa. At the back it says, Wearing the traditional beadwork that speaks a language of love and its conception of colour, contented youngsters posed by a rural village granary. So, through the idea of African authenticity, this postcard creates an idea of a romanticised Africa, which is somehow stuck in the past, and where people live lives that are reminiscent of years and years ago. All the signs of modernity has been removed from this image. So let's then go back to these images. So, when you say African art, 9 out of 10 people will have this image or one of these images in their head. Colourful, vibrant, romantic rural villages, wild animals. But these ones, they will have some trouble in seeing why these could be African art. So now what I want you to do is, after you've watched this video, is to go back to the um, tab on my UNISA which says Assignment 1 and just work through those activities. And just watch this video again. Um, this is the, the Waka Waka, this time for Africa from Shakira. So. Um, I want you to do a post-colonial critique of this video. In other words, with what you've learned now about African authenticity, tell me what is wrong with this video. Okay. 
What are the stereotypical ideas about Africa that are perpetuated through this video? Okay, you will see there are all kinds of things like color and dancing and um, there are wild animals and there are uh, poor people playing soccer on barren fields. So what are the stereotypes that we are seeing in this video and why are these stereotypes used by the producers of this video? So think about that a little bit and you may add your comments there if you want to. Now what we want to get with and what I wanted you to do with the assignment is you need to see how do contemporary African artists resist these ideas of authenticity. Now there are several ways in which they can do this and some of them use all of these ways and some of them use one or two of them and they, these are not the only ones. So I want you when you choose your examples to find your own um, ways that these artists do that. So they do that this through parody. So, um, and I'll show you an example of an artist who uses parody. Or they do it through the appropriation of aesthetics that seem African, but then they parody them, or they challenge them, or they change them. They also do it through the intermixing of different styles. So, mixing the seemingly traditional with the modern or the contemporary. They do this through questioning what culture, tradition and Africanness means and by giving us new examples or new ideas of what it could be. So it's about creating possibilities and it's about resisting the way that the West sees Africa and Africans. Here are just two examples but I, I did put some more examples on um, my UNISA. So the first one is, um, was used as the cover for the Africa Remix exhibition. It's a work by Samuel Fosso and you can, you can Google Samuel Fosso and look at some of his other works. He uses a lot of these strategies. He uses parody, he uses um, uh, intermixing of different things um, and you can discuss his work quite well um, within this framework. And then next to that is uh, Rumal Tazum. And he uses these empty jerry cans and you can read a little bit about this artist. He's a very interesting artist and he kind of parodies the African mask shapes. But he also references the tradition of African sculpture. So um, in that way he also shows us that he is, is his hybridity and the way that he also uses intertextuality is very interesting and you can read a little bit more by that. Um, I want you to please watch the videos that I posted under the Assignment 1 tab. There are some videos there um, that, that you can look at that will help you to understand the um, concepts of hybridity and diaspora as well. Those concepts um, are also explained very well in the e-reserves. You should read the e-reserves and write down for yourself working definitions of these um, terms. And you should try and find examples of artists that embody these things. Okay, I hope that this video has helped you. If you have any more questions, you are very welcome to contact me.